that covered this one? All right, great, seems to be working. Hopefully by now you have all heard about the new Medicaid Housing Stabilization Services Benefit that launched on July 20th of this year. We are excited to be able to address the health of our Medicaid recipients by offering the service to stabilize people's housing. For today's presentation, we will provide a high level overview of the service. For more details on the service, please check out our policy page, which has detailed policy information, a PowerPoint from December 2019 that goes into more specifics about the program. Um, yes, and a lot of other resources. All right, next. The goals of the service are to support an individual's transition into housing, increase long-term stability in housing, and avoid future periods of homelessness or institutionalization. Next. The two primary services in housing stabilization services are transition services, which helps people plan for, find, and move into housing, and sustaining services, which supports a person to maintain living in their home. These services are not sequential. A person doesn't need to use, have used transition services to access sustaining services. If a person first needs these services to support them in maintaining their current housing, they can access sustaining services right away. There is also a third component, housing stabilization, I mean, housing consultation. This is a new planning service ava available through housing stabilization services that provides a person-centered plan for people who do not have Medicaid-funded case management. Next. So let's dig a little into the transition and sustaining services. So some of the details are transition services, there's 150 hours per transition that are available. Um, and the, sort, the type of support, some of the supports are housing search and application process, support with budgeting, organizing the move and locating funding for deposits or household needs, and identifying benefits to help promote housing instability. Some components about sustaining services, that's, another, that's 150 hours per year. The types of supports are to develop and update a crisis or safety plan, educate on tenant landlord rights and responsibilities, advocate to prevent eviction, and training on being a good tenant, lease compliance, and household management. A person can receive services remotely, and if additional barriers are in place, a person can receive an additional 150 hours per transition of transition or sustaining services each year to help support a person's housing search or housing stability needs. Some examples of additional barriers include prior evictions, past due bills, or the presence of a criminal history. I do like to point out at this point that housing transition and housing stabilization services do not pay for the cost of housing. They pay for the people who provide the support to help a person find and keep their housing. Next. To be eligible for the service, a person needs to be on medical assistance and be 18 years or older. Beyond this, there are three basic eligibility criteria. A person must have a disability or a disabling condition, be experiencing housing instability, and have a need for services due to the limitations caused by their individual disability. Next. In these next slides, we're gonna go into each of those criteria in a little more detail. Housing Stabilization Services uses the expanded definition of disabling condition as established by the Department of Human Services Housing Support Guidelines. A person does not need to be certified disabled in order to access these services. So a disabling condition is somebody is age blind or disabled as described under Title II of the Social Security Act, or people determined by a medical professional to have any of the following conditions, a long-term injury or illness, mental illness, developmental disability, learning disability, or substance use disorder. And proof of disability can be professional state can be through the professional statement of need, a medical opinion form, proof of receipt of SSI or SSDI, or other forms of disability documentation to be determined. And these include if somebody's 65 or older, they meet the criteria. Um, or if somebody is already on medical assistance due to their disability, 
that's also proof of that's also documentation. All right. Um, note that in June of 2020, the Department of Human Services released an updated professional statement of need. The professional statement of need now includes eligibility criteria for the housing stabilization services. And just note that a county designee cannot complete the professional statement of need for this for access to housing stabilization services. So the county designee can still sign to support a person into onto housing support, but do, cannot sign for housing stabilization services. All right, next. So for housing instability, a person must meet Minnesota's definition of homelessness, be at risk of homelessness, which includes things like couch hopping and also if the person will is at risk of homelessness, if they lose their housing services, that also makes them at risk of homelessness. Um, currently transitioning or have recently transitioned from an institution or licensed or registered setting or be eligible for waiver services. And the eligibility for waiver services meets the housing instability criteria because people who are eligible for waiver services have met an institutional level of care which means they're at risk of institutionalization without the right supports. So housing instability can be documented by the professional statement of need, min choices assessment or long-term care consultation, or coordinated entry for people who are experiencing homelessness. Next. In addition to having a disabling condition and housing instability, a person must be assessed to need assistance due to their disability in one of the following areas, communication, mobility, decision-making, or managing challenging behaviors. Assess need will be captured in the same three assessment pathways as housing instability. It is important to note that the professional statement of need is the primary pathway onto the services because it captures all three of the needs-based criteria disability, housing instability, as well as assess need for services. I will now turn it over to Jensina, who will talk about coordinated entry and person-centered planning. Thanks, Becca. So coordinated entry questions in HMIS. There are five questions that have been developed by DHS that align with the other pathways onto the service min choices assessment, and the professional statement of need. These questions are located in the Homeless Management Information System, HMIS, as part of the coordinated entry assessment for each continuum of care. COCs will determine where the questions will be in the coordinated entry assessment. And all people who receive a coordinated entry assessment must have responses to these questions to ensure access to the service. These questions ask about housing instability and assess need as part of eligibility requirements for these services. Next. So this slide shows what the questions look like in the HMIS entry screen. So based on the person's on the assessor's experience with the person, coordinated entry assessors review the following five questions and use their professional judgment when selecting responses. Responses to these questions are used to generate the coordinated entry assessment document that a person will need for services. So the first question has to do with housing instability and asks, is this person experiencing housing instability? Uh, as we continue on to the other assessed need areas like communication, mobility, and decision making, the coordinated entry assessor will be asked to determine whether or not the person needs support in decision uh, with decision making related to housing, or does the person need support managing challenging behaviors to help with housing. So coordinated entry assessors will be able to answer yes, no, or unsure or unable to answer. Next slide. The image here shows the coordinated entry assessment document. So once a person has a coordinated entry assessment completed and the five questions are answered for housing stabilization services, uh, Service Point will be able to generate a coordinated entry assessment document. And this document is what will be used to show uh, DHS eligibility uh, 
for services, either the, through the assessed, um, assessed need for services and housing instability through the coordinated entry assessment pathway. So um, as you can see, the assessment will show the person's name, the provider, and then it will uh, provide information related to uh, the questions that were asked in the coordinated entry assessment document. Next. So as I noted, the document um, can be printed for the person. It can also be saved as a PDF that can be sent to an email address or stored in the person's vault on HB 101. Um, for those of you who may or may not know about HB 101 or Housing Benefits 101, it offers a secure vault feature, which allows uh, both professionals and people looking for services or housing to securely store information. Um, it is encrypted and then uh, it can be those documents can be sent securely between professionals and people um, being served through that platform as well. So that can be really helpful too if there isn't a printer available uh, right away at the time of assessment, it can be saved as a PDF and stored in that way as well. In addition to the coordinated entry assessment document, a person will still need proof of disability and a person-centered plan to meet all of the eligibility criteria. Assessors and other coordinated entry staff can direct people to get in touch with their targeted or waiver case manager to complete their plan. And if someone does not have a targeted or waiver case manager, the person can be directed to a housing consultant who must be enrolled with Minnesota healthcare programs to complete their plan. Organizations involved in the coordinated entry process may want to enroll as providers to help get people onto services and add a new revenue stream to help pay for staff time when completing these uh, services and assessment. Next, thanks. Um, housing stabilization services are home and community-based services and must meet all CMS home and community-based requirements. One of these requirements is that a person must have a person-centered plan. And that's what was referenced in the previous slide. The person-centered planning process must be driven by the individual, include the person's strengths, interests, wants, as well as the supports they need, and help the person make an informed choice about their housing stabilization service provider. Next slide. The responsibility of the person-centered plan depends on if other professionals are involved in the person's life. If the person already has an MA-funded waiver case manager, that waiver case manager will complete or update the person's coordinated services and supports plan. Or if the person has a senior care coordinator, the senior care coordinator will update the coordinated care plan to include housing stabilization. If a person has a targeted case manager, the targeted case manager completes a housing focused person centered plan. And it should be noted that that plan is very specific and it was designed just for these services that can be found um, through the eDocs page at DHS. If a person does not have a targeted case manager or an MA funded case manager, then the person needs to find an enrolled housing consultant in their area to complete this requirement. Next slide. This slide provides a visual overview of the process that an eligible person would take to enroll in housing stabilization services. So the beginning box is that person would complete an assessment and that assessment could occur through the professional statement of need, a min choices assessment or long-term care consultation or through a coordinated entry assessment. Once the person completes their assessment and they are determined to have an assessed need for services, housing instability, and a disabling condition, they'll need to get a person-centered plan. That person-centered plan can be completed through a housing consultant or a targeted case manager via the housing-focused person-centered plan or a, the uh, coordinated services and supports plan, sorry, that should say coordinated in that community, uh, through a waiver case manager or a coordinated care plan through a senior care coordinator. Once the plan and assessment are completed and a housing stabilization services provider is selected, 
that Housing Stabilization Services provider will submit the assessment, plan, and documentation of disability or disabling condition via an eligibility request form to DHS. DHS will conduct a review of the person's eligibility and determine whether or not they can start services. And if a person is able to start services, the provider is notified through minutes that they can begin working with the person and the person will receive a notice via US mail. Next slide. There are some services that a person can't get at the same time as they receive housing stabilization services. These services include housing access coordination, which is available in the 1915C waivers. Um, housing access coordination will be removed from waivers and uh, the person will be able to access them through the state plan. The person will then transition onto housing stabilization services at their annual renewal with their waiver case manager. In addition, a person cannot receive housing stabilization services and the following services at the same time, relocation service coordination, assertive community treatment, and moving home Minnesota. It is important to remember that if a person is served through assertive community treatment or an ACT team, uh, the person, while the person cannot receive housing stabilization services, a person is to receive housing support services while on ACT. So if you ever have questions about uh, what housing services a person is getting through their ACT team, uh, please reach out to that person's case manager or uh, for more information about what services are being received. Next slide. Finally, housing stabilization services will not duplicate the following services. If more intensive housing related services are needed, a person can receive the following as well as housing stabilization services. So that includes ARMS, targeted case management, 1915C waiver services, semi-independent living services, behavioral health home, and healthcare coordination through substance use disorder reform services or CCBHC. So this means that a person can also can have an ARMS worker and a housing stabilization service provider or the person could have a targeted case manager and a housing stabilization service provider. I'll now hand it back over to Becca, who will cover a few remaining important pieces of information and conclude our presentation today. Thank you. Thanks, Jensia. One of the requirements of home and community-based services is that assessment and planning are completed independently and free of conflict from the service provision. However, it is important to know that this is a federal requirement for these services. A provider can always provide, be enrolled to provide both housing consultation or targeted case management and housing transition sustaining services. Providers just cannot provide them to the same person without any exception in place. So here is a visual you can see that the assessment and the housing focus plan can be completed by the same provider but the, the provider who provides both or either of those cannot also provide the housing transition and sustaining service. Next slide. There will be an exception process to the conflict of interest requirements. These exceptions are for provider shortage areas in certain geographic areas or providers who specialize in serving a particular cultural group or non-English speakers. There will be a process to submit an exception request if you think you meet one of these categories. It is important to note that due to COVID, the conflict of interest requirement is waived through the duration of the federal public health emergency, which now goes until the end of January. However, providers should be prepared to come into compliance with this requirement as the waiver ends and at the, at the end of the public health emergency. Next slide. So here's some tips to strategically plan and deliver services. First, we need to consider ways to maximize housing stabilization services and integrate it into the community. One possibility is recruit counties and tribes to provide housing consultation services for people who are not receiving MA-funded case management. This creates easier access to planners and therefore more access to services 
and frees up community-based providers to offer housing transition sustaining services. Consider ways housing stabilization can help fund parts of the coordinated entry system. And this is looking at the navigators and now the housing transition service is a billable service for some of those services that currently aren't uh, as easily funded. Think about how housing stabilization services can cover services paid for through state grant dollars and then how you can target those grant dollars towards services not covered by housing stabilization services. Next. So these next two slides are really resource slides. Um, and I believe that the presentation will be, I'm not sure if the presentation is going to be sent out to people who have participated, but these are live links to the housing stabilization policy page, which has a lot of information. Um, the Minnesota Healthcare Provider Provider Manual, which helps provide, which is how pro gives providers the information to enroll in housing stabilization services. And the provider directory is where you will find providers that are already enrolled in our service. So you search under home and community based services and then subtype housing stabilization services. There's a frequently asked questions document on our policy page as well as a person served workflow, which is a visual example of how people can move on to our services. We also have multiple webinars that give more information on the services. And if you want to contact us, please feel free to email dhshousingstabilization at state.mn.us. Next. So transition and sustaining plans are required for these services. So providers must develop plans that, you know, work with the person in a person-centered way to say how these services will support the person. We don't require a specific plan, only that everybody has one. So if your agency doesn't already have a developed plan that you're using to support people, HB 101 has a wide variety of transition-related tools that can be used to build a transition plan. And there's soon to be uploaded a Keeping My Housing Plan, which will, which is essentially a sustaining service plan. All right, I think we've covered these other pieces. So now we can open up to questions. So let's see here. So type any questions that you have in the Q&A box. So the first question is, if a client receives SSI, do they still require a professional statement of need? And the answer to that is yes, because the professionals, they still need, they don't require a PSN, they just require either a min choices, a professional statement of need, or a coordinated entry, because that's the assessment for needing these particular services, which is required to access the services. Um, the next question is, are chronic diseases like type 2 diabetes considered a disability? And yes, those uh, physical disability is um, a disability that can access these services if people meet the other eligibility criteria. Um, the next question is, how many people in Minnesota are currently using this program? And I, I can answer that, Becca. That's not uh, yeah, so looking at our numbers as of Monday, we have uh, just over 1,500 people approved for these services and receiving services already, which is uh, really fantastic. The majority of them are coming through with waiver case managers, but we are getting a growing number of people who are having their services approved through the Housing Focus Person Center Plan with the professional statement of need assessment pathway. So just over 1,500 people are approved in receiving services. And the last time I checked, we were close to 120 providers statewide. And I do want to point out that it was anticipated that 2,500 people would access our services in the first year. And with the people that are with so the fact that we're already at 1,500 shows the need for these services, and it is, it is more than what was expected. 
Um, do you have a success story of how a provider is serving folks and strengthening their organization through earned revenue? Um, Jensen, I don't know. At this point, we don't. The services are quite new and we are working very, very hard to get these services smoothly imp implemented. So we haven't had time to do outreach um, to providers to gather success stories at this time. I don't know, Jensen, if you've heard any through the great then. Um, I have not. So then there is a question, what are some tips and tricks that users should think about when accessing this program? I think it would be helpful to get more clarification if the person's looking from the vantage point of a person seeking services or for a provider. Mm -hmm. So if whoever wrote that question could clarify that, that would be helpful. While we're waiting for that person to um, circle back, I think what would be really helpful is to take a look at our frequently asked questions document that Becca referenced that's located on our website. We do have, uh, it's, it's a, an extensive and comprehensive FAQ document that goes over a variety of really nuanced questions that we've received from uh, lots of different people over the past few months. So that'll be a helpful document when you're trying to find out some of the nuances of the program. Okay, we've had another question come in. If a person does not have a case management or a care coordinator and does not meet criteria for coordinated entry and does not need a waiver service, how would they get the process starting started for housing stabilization services? Who gets them connected to providers? Is this process different if they have a managed care plan? So this is the, the process to get on the services if people don't have a case manager is to connect with a housing consultant. Um, they can either do that themselves or if anybody is working with them, they can support them to connect to a housing consultant. And then they will complete that plan and get a professional statement of need. And then that plan and the professional statement of need will be uploaded into the eligibility review system. And they can begin services because they will have chosen their transition sustaining service provider through with their housing consultant. The process is not different whether they're with managed care or not. For the professional statement of need, here's another question. Some medical providers are not 100% clear on what would qualify for services. This refers to section three on the professional statement of need, and that section is the section that identifies need for housing stabilization services. Um, mobility communication needs, making informed decisions, managing behaviors. For example, if the person has a vehicle and can get to and from appointments without guidance, should this area be checked? Is there a spot that medical providers can look to get better understanding? Gentina, do you want to take this one? Yeah, we are currently working on developing some guidance uh, to go along with a professional statement of, statement of need. We've had lots of questions come through about uh, how to best complete this form, especially now that the use of the PSN has really expanded. So we are currently working on that. Um, as far as uh, section three is concerned on the PSN. We're really looking at connecting that person's assessed need for services with their need for housing. So uh, I think you know that's that would be my kind of response there, Becca. I don't know if you have any additional thoughts on that question. Um, the only other piece to if if you are a qualified professional or if you're connecting with qualified professionals to have professional statements of need completed. 
is to make sure that the qualified professionals understand that this it does not require an official diagnosis. It is recognizing that the person requires support in one of these four areas and is experiencing housing instability. All right, are there any other questions? I would like to just um, mention that we do uh, have a listserv. So if you go to our policy page, uh, you can sign up for our mailing list at the very bottom of that page. And we send out lots of announcements, including different training opportunities. So we do, we have offered a Q&A session um, about once a week here. And the last session we have is for next Tuesday. Typically, we ask that folks have reviewed other types of guidance that we have available first because they tend to be uh, pretty detailed and nuanced questions that are asked, but that might be a, a good uh, resource if you're looking to learn a little bit more about the service and have your questions answered in real time. And we're hoping to continue that into 2021. Well, I do, haven't seen any further questions come in. Um, Jensina, do you want to just take a quick look at that um, before? And if if we don't have any more questions, then we'll probably just wrap it up. So it looks I like we did get a... Oh, go ahead, go Becca. Ahead, Jensina, go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, it looks like we did get a question from Kathy who asked, could you speak on documentation of services to clients by case managers? Um, I... I would like a little bit more detail with regards to that question, unless it's just about documentation requirements in general. And I can say that the uh, Minnesota Healthcare Programs Provider Manual does outline documentation requirements for these services. So that would be a helpful place to look. If that does not answer your question, please feel free to write back with clarification. And then there's just a question if this PowerPoint will be provided. Rhonda, do you know if that's something that will be provided or if the presentation will be recorded and available on the MCH website? Yeah, we will post both the PowerPoints or the presentations as well as the recordings on our website or links on our website. Those will probably be up sometime next week or the week after. Thanks, Rhonda. I don't see any other questions, so I can turn it back to you to wrap up. All right. Well, thank you so much. We're, um, we're really grateful that you dug into a topic that um, can really benefit organizations ac across the state and also really impact um, housing stability across the state. So thank you for taking time to put this presentation together and um, share this information with all of our advocates uh, across the state. Um, I just want to highlight what uh, our next two sessions, which will be tomorrow at nine o'clock and 11 o'clock. At nine o'clock, we will dig into information about homelessness um, among Native Americans. And we have folks from Wilder um, and tribes to join and talk about that work. And then at 11 o'clock, we will be hearing an update uh, from the Interagency Council on Homelessness. So we hope you'll all join us back here at nine o'clock and hope everyone has a great day. And thank you again to our panelists.